right, welcome everybody to the inaugural episode of Tech Done Different. With me today is my business partner and my good friend, Steve Bono. Steve, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Ted. I'm glad I'm on the first one. The very, very first one. Yeah, Steve, you were you were actually instrumental in helping to devise the uh, the concept here. So it'll be interesting to see how you do as a guest on the own show that you uh, had a hand in helping design. The tables have turned. <laughs> how the turntables. How the turntables. <laughs> So for those who don't know Steve, Steve is one of the, the founders of Independent Security Evaluators, a security consulting company that uh, I am lucky to be in business with Steve on. And so Steve, maybe for people who don't uh, know you or know about the business yet, maybe you could give them just the, the quick introduction to what ISE is. And you know, maybe a place to start would be just sort of tell the origin story. How did how'd you go about doing it? Sure. Well, we are a information security consulting firm. We started back in 2005 officially. We got started by, it was a me, a, a couple other students in grad school and one of our professors, we'd been working on a variety of research projects, but one in particular we knew was going to sort of make a splash in the press and uh, that, that work was uh, reverse engineering car immobilizers and basically showing that you could steal a car without the physical key present. And we started our company because we were having fun doing this as students. We wanted to do it professionally and we figured maybe somebody else will, will, will pay us to do this sort of research to hack things and not get in trouble for it. And also get paid for it. And that was the premise of our business way back then. We've come a long way since being students, but it's a, it's been a wild ride. I love it. So obviously in the business that is ethical hacking and security consulting, that it's sort of the definition even of what this show is about, right? Thinking differently and going against conventional wisdom. Um, by the way, before I ask this next question, cheers. Well, welcome to the show. Uh, what, are, what are you drinking there, Steve, by the way? Drinking uh, Jim Beam and root beer. Nice. Well, I'm drinking a, uh, a bottle of Macallan that, that we got uh, in Scotland when we were there before pandemic uh, set in. And she chose better than I did this afternoon. I think so. <laughs> I like that you made sure everyone knew it was the afternoon yes. and uh, not the it's morning. probably before noon where you are, so... <laughs> Well, let's not let's not let everybody know that yet. <laughs> so let's talk about this idea of going against the grain and going against conventional wisdom. I mean, here we are having a drink in the middle of the day. In a way, that's symbolic of going against the grain. Uh, you're definitely one of the more contrarian thinkers that I know. How do you do that? How how do you, in your own approach to ideas? I mean, maybe walk us through when you hear someone say something about the way things are supposed to be done you think about things differently. How can the tech leaders and the leaders in security who are listening to the show, how can they think like you think? How do you think? Well, I don't know if I do too much of it so consciously, but I have noticed that there are certain trigger situations that usually result in some fun thought experiments. And they tend to center around whenever somebody says you can't do something for some reason. Uh, I guess I always remember that that guy from the character from Lost, John Locke, who always said, don't tell me what I can't do. I don't really identify with that character at all, but his, his phrase is pretty much, I hear it every time somebody says, you can't do this or you can't do that. Or even, a lot of the times it's just a brush off of an idea somebody has just had. But as soon as I hear it, I think to my, I always think, well, what do you mean? No, what do you mean we can't? Why can't we? And a lot of the time I'll just quickly realize, oh, that's completely impractical. No wonder you think that. But people say it all the time for things that are not impractical at all. And they just give up, like they're giving up hope in that exact moment when they could just critically think about it for a little bit. Why can't you do that thing you just said? 
And I've always thought of it like a challenge. Whenever somebody says you can't hack this, it's unhackable. I've always wanted to say, well, let's find out, right? And I, I think it's it's a lot the same whether it comes to politics or or research or life lessons or just what anybody's doing. As soon as I hear that you're not allowed to do something, my brain is automatically thinks of, well, how are we going to make that possible then? You're echoing a lot of themes out of the book, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Have you read that book before? No, I have not. So uh, it's a pretty famous book about personal finance, but there's this uh, idea that's presented in that book where the author advises against people saying, I can't afford that. Because yeah. what that does is that shuts your brain down to say, well, that's the, I've hit the wall on this. I can't afford it. And what is recommended instead that people say things like, how can I afford that? Because that opens up a whole new vein of thinking, which is to say, well, I can't afford it based on current circumstances. So how do I change the circumstances? So maybe could you talk about maybe some of the research that you've been involved with or research that you've overseen recently that has done something like that, where it's, it's looked at a situation and said, okay, well, the assumption is this. What if instead it was that? What if instead the assumption was different? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the last major research I was involved in was the hospital study that you know you and I worked on a couple of years ago. I think the assumptions a lot of times people make, especially in security, are that other people have done their jobs correctly or that it's not their responsibilities. Maybe uh, the biggest assumption mistake is that it's not everybody's individual responsibility in some part to protect themselves. They always wanna offload that to another organization or an institution. And it's helpful to think, yes, the hospital will be the ones protecting me, but then you go talk to the people at the hospital and they say, oh, well, the medical device manufacturers are responsible for that, those security features. And then the medical device manufacturers say, oh, the hospital network administrators are responsible for protecting these devices on the network. And eventually you get to realize everybody's passing the buck to somebody else. The consumer has practically no power to do anything about it because if I go to the hospital and say, only hook me up to your secure devices. They're, gonna, they're not gonna know how to handle that. And plus I'm probably incapacitated in some way if I need to be hooked up to a device in the first place. So it's sad. Um, and so I don't know if it's so much that I would challenge those assumptions, but I think those assumptions are all wrong and people make them a lot. Uh, what we did with that study was try and show that. And I don't think we knew those assumptions going in that everybody was making those assumptions, but it's pretty common mm -hmm. where you just pass the buck on some other group. For people who aren't familiar with the study, maybe could you just give the, the 30,000 foot overview of, of what was done and what was found? Sure. We, uh, we decided to just take a look at hospital security and ask the simple question, what's the worst thing that could happen? And then we wanted to decide, and then we decided to see if we could demonstrate that it was possible in a typical hospital setting. And when we went through that thought exercise, the question, what's the worst thing that could happen? We quickly realized you could you could kill a person or you could harm a person severely. And then we realized, no, no, harming the child is worse. And then, oh, harming a whole floor of children might be worse. Is it possible? that there could be an attack of some kind that could you know, dismantle an entire hospital and injure many people all at once. And we found, yeah, it was, it was fairly straightforward and easy to do. There was very little security at all the hospitals we looked like, well, very little effective security. They were dramatically understaffed. The technology was all sitting there waiting to be exploited. And in many cases, we just walked in the front door, sat down at a public terminal and started starting exploiting them. Uh, and the goal of our research wasn't to actually harm anyone. It was to identify ways in which it's possible, raise awareness about 
how these attacks might come about down the road and create a methodology for securing all of these hospitals. And, you know, we delivered all that in, in our report and it was probably not even a year later or two years later when some really big ransomware attacks happened that shut down medical facilities on the East coast. Lots of hospitals have been suffering them individually, but there was the MedStar breach, I think was a pretty big one. And I saw in the news just the other day, I don't remember where it was, but they're, they're portraying the death of one or more people at a particular hospital as being the first cyber security related deaths based on uh, attack against medical devices. So yeah, that, that happened in Germany. That was, uh, that was not intended. The intent wasn't to harm people, but it was a ransomware attack yeah. where when that patient got to the hospital, the hospital couldn't actually take the patient. So they sent them somewhere else and that patient died in transit to the second location, mm -hmm. which is certainly a tragedy. So in a way, uh, not even in a way, directly, security research, which is what you're talking about, forces companies who are being researched to themselves think differently, right? Because they're, they're maybe not as <laughs> excited about receiving the findings as maybe security researchers might be as submitting them, but it ultimately forces that company to start thinking about their, um, their approach differently. So in the years that you've been doing this, things have certainly changed over the last you know, 15 plus years. What would you say are some of the major changes in thinking and behavior that you're seeing technology leaders and security leaders implement as a result of security researchers doing what security researchers do? Yeah, um, let's see, something that's changed in their mindsets. I think when I first started doing this <clears throat> back in the early 2000s, um, well, professionally, I guess they, the big thing we had to convince people of was that there was, that there was any threat at all. The general response we would get when talking to companies about how secure their products are, are they would, they would say, well, we've not been hacked, so they must be secure. And that was the prevailing logic in the early 2000s. That changed. Now, nobody really nobody in any position where they could do anything about it has uh, uh, believes security operates that way. They all recognize that a lack of an attack does not equate to security. Um, and that morphed into uh, probably t the idea that, okay, we, we are going to be attacked eventually. We need to, we need to buckle down and start doing some type of assessment. What happened in that case was then, then there was an onslaught of confusion having to do with, well, what, what do we buy? How do we do that? And a lot of snake oil came out of the, you know, came onto the scene at that point and people were buying it up in droves. Then people started to realize it's not so much about protecting yourself, but about uh, just coping with this as a situation that's always going to be a problem. Security is not a thing you do once and then you you find that you are now protected and you and you can move on. That was the, the thing you had to do that one time. Security is an ongoing thing that has to be done at every step of the process and redone over and over. Just like exercise. It's a exercise for your business really. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting observation for sure. The idea that that security doesn't end there's no finish line. Um, you know, as I've been, as I was doing the research on, on my book on Hackable, the, one of the questions that I was asking these different uh, leaders in technology that I was interviewing was asking them, you know, in different phrasing, or actually a lot of times this exact phrasing, you know, what makes security a pain for you? Where, why is it difficult? And I have to say that it was probably 60% of them echoed what you just mentioned, the idea that um, we don't know when it's done, there's no finish line, uh, is, is good enough good enough? 
What, what's your advice to that person, that leader who is trying to answer that question? How can they ascertain when they can move on to do something else? When is good enough good enough? Yeah, that's a really hard question to answer. And it's pretty hard to convince other people of what is, when is a good, what's enough? Because people tend to visualize what's enough in a lot of different ways. Some people may say until risk hits zero, it's not enough. I'm in the camp that I would say there are points of diminishing returns on the efficacy of what you might purchase for security. And so uh, you should change your tactics after a certain point, but there's also a lower bar. It's what you wanna do is find where you are on this scale of spending too little and spending too much and sort of looking for an optimal spot. And once you find it, um, live there and kind of reassess if that's where you should be from time to time, but live there and do all the things that make sense uh, at that, uh, you know, in that range and change them up. So as you're, if you're, for instance, uh, focusing on one aspect of security in the next cycle, focus on another and keep maturing gradually over time, but you never get to the point where you're done. It's never going to happen. So, you know, I, Obvious advice is be prepared for annual security spends, not just one-time deals. And uh, but it's always going to be a risk reward equation. It's not going to be as clear cut for people. So being able to make that call at the C-suite level is is important, and it's a really difficult call to make. Mm -hmm. You obviously are a believer in uh, independence and being objective and unbiased and everything. Uh, it happens all the time where your <laughs> clients want you to do or even phrase things the way that, that they see it. For anyone who's listening to this who runs into similar situations where their own view is being manipulated potentially in ways that they don't agree with by someone else. How do you handle that when a client or some other external party says, Hey, no, it shouldn't be critical severity. It should be medium severity. And how do you deal with that? Yeah. Well, we get pushed back a lot for all sorts of reasons. Um, uh, well, let me just pick one of them. <laughs> Let's pick one <laughs> Let's of those reasons and go after it that way. We, uh, if we do work in like a, a three-party exchange of some kind where one group has to prove the security of their product to a third party, or we're the third party, however you want to look at it, we're doing an assessment of one product to show another company how secure it is. Well, that's what they're attempting to do. When we find significant issues, they, the company who owns the product that we found it in can certainly get a little miffed that we're finding problems. It's their baby. They're emotionally attached to it. Uh, it's really a good consultant can, can cut through that, that sort of attitude and help them understand the real value of what's happening. And we help explain to both of those parties that you were never going to show us a product we weren't going to kick the crap out of. And it, we were going to find a lot of problems with that was just what was going to happen. So don't feel bad. What you should feel good about is that you're doing it in the first place. You're better now that you did it and you're going to keep on this track. You got to keep doing it, stay healthy. And the real, uh, the real indicator that you're dealing with a, 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 a secure product or a company with a, mature security perspective is how often they do it and what they do rather than how many vulnerabilities are found. Mm -hmm. Because you can, I mean, there's nothing wrong with finding vulnerabilities. You're going to always create and patch vulnerabilities. It's a matter of how often are you checking to find them? That's really what it's about. Yeah, that's a great, great shift in the mindset. So you steer their mindset away from, oh no, you're poking holes in my thing into, Look at me! I'm doing something good. I'm I'm making 
I, I'm mature. Yep. Right. <laughs> and it sounds, it's, it's not, it's not really a sneaky thing to do. It is, that's the reality of it. They just don't understand it that way. Yeah. It's like how people might want to say, oh, we have a clean bill of health. Like literally use that phrase to describe that they have no vulnerabilities when that's not the, what you're saying. That's not the reality because that just means you probably aren't going deep enough or not looking in the right area because they exist. The question is, are you going, are, are you being thorough enough? And that's essentially what you're, what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about, uh, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about culture. So you've, you've built a pretty vibrant um, culture. And uh, one of the things that is definitely different at ISE than at other companies are knives. So tell me about what it is that, well, first of all, tell everyone about what it is that uh, is the knife culture at ISE. And why is it that you like the idea of knives and how has that been an approach about uh, approach by you to the culture at ISC to make it sort of be different maybe than your typical corporate culture? Well, I think it is a little bit different, but I don't know if there was ever a lot of relatable reasons why, except for the <laughs> fact that I just like knives and a lot of other people at the company also happen to like knives. And so we decided to give everybody at the company a knife. So now when you join ISC, you get a standard issue knife of some kind. It's a different uh, size, shape, or purpose for uh, depending on your, your position. But yeah, it's just a nice little present for everybody to have. I think everybody should carry a knife. I don't, I, they're very useful tools. They've come in handy quite often. And I've only cut myself a few times. So it's not so bad. <laughs> Certainly that first holiday party when those knives were handed out yeah. after the drinks, that was, that yeah. was going against conventional wisdom of. Yeah. Safety. Yeah. That one, maybe we could have done before everybody started drinking, <laughs> give the knives out the next day. I don't know. Some other plan, but only a couple of people got hurt. That <laughs> well, one thing that definitely has resulted from this, this odd uh, maybe odd isn't the right word, but definitely this different approach to a cultural element is whether or not people like knives, they talk about this thing. And, you know, people go from one end of the spectrum is they use it for the intended purpose to the other end of the spectrum is maybe they just use it to open packages that get delivered. But the point is, it's a useful thing. It's assigned to a role. You get a new one as you get promoted. That's a better knife. And uh, it definitely it reinforces sort of that our culture is a thing that matters, uh, mm -hmm. at least at this company. Yeah, I mean, it serves a lot of cultural purposes at ISC, but not necessarily because it's a knife. But whenever you give out, uh, you're giving out, a, it's a symbol. It's a symbol of the company. Everybody has a similar symbol. It uh, helps people align their thinking in one direction with where your company's headed. It's first, it is also a pretty cool gift. I mean, a lot of people just straight out like it, but you know, being able to have a physical item that you maybe carry or keep on your desk, just, you know, it's a nice thing. I think lots of companies give those sorts of things out. Not a lot of them aren't knives, which I guess is different and makes people, you know, think it's pretty cool, but it is really just a, a, a token more than a knife. Yeah, that, that's so spot on, right? So the, the advice isn't, hey, every other company, go give your people utility knives or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's give them something that represents something you're trying to reinforce. And now one of those things I'm hearing you say is the community aspect. Everyone has a knife. It's cool. That's one of the things that, you know, the, it's an intangible, but it's one of the things that ISC's culture is certainly defined by. I mean, I, I think about even the knives that you and I have, the partner knives. Um, tell us about zero tolerance and and how quality that is and how that reflects some of the other yeah. um, values we have. Well, I, you know, we pick good knives too. I mean, quality <laughs> is one of our core values at ISC. And uh, we, we try to just imbue quality in everything we do, in, in, whether it's the gifts we're giving 
to the employees, the gifts we're giving to potential customers and customers or, and, but all the work we do, it's really not done until a group of people are satisfied that it's high quality. And we've, we've established a culture where quality is, is very, very important. And your, your teammates are going to get upset if you're not, you know, delivering as high quality work as you could be. They recognize it pretty quickly. <laughs> they'll, they'll let you know about it. Indeed. How are, how should other companies, other leaders, like let's say you're sitting in a room right now with other, you know, startup founders or CTOs or CIOs or whoever, and they are wondering how should they inject values into their culture? They know that having a value led culture definitely impacts performance and impacts outcomes. What would you say to that person? I did not recognize the value of core values until uh, we had created them. I didn't put a lot of thought into it except to try and pick a small number of distinct qualities that I thought were really important in the work that we had done up to that point. And I wanted to just capture it and say, this is what the, these are the reasons we're succeeding because of quality, dedication, integrity, and education. Those four things are why we're successful. I think they're the core reasons. Let's write them out and let's start living by and working by these, um, you know, these values. What it managed, what it ended up doing was uh, it reinforced those values for everybody for sure, but it also began to attract people who also like felt those values inside themselves. So you end up with a, a group of people who all share core values and they were drawn to the company in the first place by, you know, by reading them on our website or, or however it, it works out. And it's a good filter for people who we want to be around. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely recommend that for any, any, any startup, decide what makes you, you as the, the founders. Don't try to, don't create values for something you aren't in the first place, just for the sake of attracting people with those values. It needs to come from the people who are already there. And that's, those are the values I thought were demonstrated in our work. Hmm. That's an interesting way to frame it that you're not, you're, what you're saying is not to uh, create a value like we're going to be this kind of company, but rather to say, who are you already? And just write that down. And that is the most authentic way to do it. Is that a correct summary? It wor that works for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think being authentic is uh, in my life, that's been useful. I don't know if it works for everyone. I don't know if it will work for every company, but it works for us. Mm -hmm. I would imagine it would work for many. When you think about the different ways that whether it's in terms of culture or in terms of research or in terms of clients, in terms of the business, like, you know, pick a domain. When you think about the, the things that you've succeeded upon, um, what would you say is one of the things that you're most proud of, either the most proud of or on the list? Um, where, what, what can you look at and say, I approach that in a, in a different way and I'm proud of the result? Hmm. Well, I'm proud of all the work that we do. Uh, we continue to surprise everyone. I mean, we continue to surprise ourselves all the time. I really enjoy watching our employees grow. We have a lot of people who join ISC uh, fresh out of school. We can watch them develop professionally. It's hard to say what's something in particular because the people I think are who I am most proud of and what I'm most proud of, but it's not one person in particular because so many of them uh, I feel that way about. Uh, as for me, myself, I guess one thing, 
I think it probably has a lot to do with whenever I, I, I like it's the people who ever said you couldn't do it, right? Anybody who ever gave me the idea that I wasn't going to be able to do it in the first place, it's a nice, I don't know, middle finger to any of those people. So um, I'm proud that we were able to, we're a company the size that we are with as many smart people as we have. And that's just awesome. Yeah. Tell, don't tell Steve, you can't do it. Steve, you're going to get hit up on LinkedIn with all kinds of sales. People are like, you won't take my, you can't take my sales call. <laughs> so look forward to that. Yeah. Um, Looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah. <laughs> it is true though. I, I totally hear you on, on the people and that's, that feels so abstract, right? To, to say, I'm proud of not an individual, but the collection of individuals. But, you know, we've, you and I have talked about this idea that we refer to people who go on after ISE as alumnus, uh, as alumni, because they, we take great pride in building them to be better the day they leave than the day they arrived. And we certainly don't celebrate people leaving, but when they go on and do great things, you know, while it's, it's bittersweet, we're not happy to see them go, but we're very proud of them in the way they continue to make contributions. So yeah, I think that's, that's really good advice for other leaders as well. So let's, maybe let's think of the flip side of that. You think about certainly to get, to have achieved things as you have, you have to fail along the way. So if we think about stumbles that you've had, you know, things that we've tried or didn't work out, what would you say are, are some of the failures that you really learned from and, and what did you learn? And, and maybe what do you, what would you do differently now as you think about how that went? Oh, well, failures. I would say that maybe it's more, uh, I've come a long way personally, I think over the last 10 plus years running ISE, I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about how to work with other people. Um, you know, I, I don't, nothing in particular, be, I guess the thing that is important is you better be prepared to grow and always keep growing because any individual thing I would say about the stupid thing I did five, 10 years ago, it was a, it was dumb. It's not really the thing itself that it's important, but you got to be ready to say, oh, I've been doing things wrong for a long time. It's time to start doing things right and make those changes and, and adapt because it's hard to say. I mean, there's been times where I've had really close relationships with employees and, and as their boss, and that hasn't always been an appropriate thing. But then I've had the opposite where I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't get along with them enough. So I don't want to tell people like how to behave. I don't, you have to figure that out for yourself, but you know, I guess it's just about being able to look at yourself and say that was a mistake and it's time to change that type of, uh, of behavior. And, you know, we've done that over the years, many, many times, but usually smaller things. I don't really know what advice to give on it though. <laughs> right. Well, certainly to find the, the silver lining in the mistakes and, you know, mm -hmm. reframing mistakes as opportunities for growth. Or yeah, how about we just stick with that? Every time you make a mistake, just say it was really it was an advantage. I was uh, I <laughs> yeah. was, I was doing that to learn, discovering a benefit, not uncovering a, a deficiency. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we're joking, but that is actually pretty valid advice that a lot of a lot of other people need to hear. Right? That there's there really the only failure, as I see it, really is um, repeating the same dumb mistakes over and over again. Yeah. There's either you succeed or you learned as long as whatever happens of the outcome, as long as you're moving forward, then that's, that's great. And that I think is echoing what you're saying. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good way to put it. Cool. Well, Steve, you've been awesome. It's been great having you on the show. Uh, as we wrap up, if people want to get a hold of you, what, how should they do that? What do you want them to go do? Well, yeah, uh, hit us up on our website, isc.io. 
that's where you'll find all of our different, you know, Twitters, LinkedIn's contact forms. Uh, you can email us there or hit us up on Twitter. Awesome. Well, Steve, it's uh, it's been good having a drink with you. Always you good to uh, good to chat. Uh, thanks for being on the show, and we will uh, post it soon. Thank you very much. Anytime. Take it easy, Ted. All See right. you. See ya.